Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's CPH exam review webinar. Today the topic of conversation would be program planning and evaluation as well as a second part on collaboration and partnerships. Now I'm sure most of you are familiar with the CPH credential and in previous webinars I've explained it but we always get the question asked of, of why I should be certified um, because you have your PhD or your MD or your TESS but in brief, the certification in public health is the only credential for public health that demonstrates not only your knowledge of key public health sciences, but also your commitment to the field of public health, which is the important differential. And as the uh, field of public health grows and continues its mission, um, it's crucial for public health professionals to stay current and to stay committed uh, to public health. I just wanted to go over just a few resources. Um, for, uh, for studying, uh, there are certain things that we recommend um, as you go along. Uh, the first thing that we recommend that you review, if you have not already, is the CPH content outline. And here you can see that there are 10 content areas uh, evenly distributed, 10% for evidence-based approaches to public health, communication, leadership, law and ethics, public health biology, collaboration and partnerships, program planning and evaluation, program management, policy, and health equity and social justice. So on the exam, you will see an evenly distributed um, uh, content area of questions. You won't see anything heavily weighted in one or the other. Uh, we also have some free sample questions um, in the format on the CPH exam, and that's going to be available on the NBPHE website. Um, along with that, we're going to have a 50-question sample item bank um, available for you to uh, review and get a feel for the type of questions. We are also going to have uh, additional webinars that are coming up. Uh, that'll be lecture-based and Q&A. And then we also have a CPH study guide on the ASPPH website. And that is a four fee um, uh, collection of sample questions, uh, but you can log on and you can go through um, as many uh, practice exams as you want. And this was written by item writers um, for the CPH exam. These are not live questions, but are, are those written by public health experts that have gone through the same type of training. So they'll be very similar to what you will see on the exam. And then lastly, we also have a, a new um, published APHA press study guide. Um, our esteemed editors, uh, Karen and Jamie and Hari, are from the University of South Florida College of Public Health. Uh, they worked hard with their faculty and staff at USF to develop this exam review book. Um, we do consider it the gold standard of a text-based exam review guide, um, and that is something that you can purchase either an ebook or print um, via the APHA bookstore, and that's at APHA.org. Now, before we get started and I turn it over to our presenters, I want to cover a few administrative items. Um, you're going to see an orange box with a white arrow that you can click on to open up your control panel. And once you do that, you will see um, various options. One of those options would be a question box. And you can enter in questions at any time. Uh, if it's just a general question, I'll be moderating that and I will answer them as they come along. Um, and then if there's uh, questions about the content, please enter them in as you think of them, as it's uh, being discussed. But we're going to save those questions until the end of the presentation so that we ensure that we can get through all of the content um, that is being presented today. And then, as always, this uh, exam review webinar is being recorded and will be posted, as well as a PDF version of the slides on the NBPHE uh, website. And we have... Um, amended the problem that we had with the video postings. And so the past three webinars that we've done are all posted up there on the NBPHE website. Um, an additional change that you'll see is that we're restructuring the format of that page to reflect the current content, content outline. Pri uh, previously, we had arranged it in the five core areas of public health, and now we are going to um, uh, distribute all of the archived presentations in that new uh, content outline. So with that, I am happy to turn the presentation over to Dr. Karen Liller and Dr. Karen Jennifer Marshall from the University of South Florida College of Public Health. Ladies. Well, thank you very much, Erin. Hello. 
I'm Dr. Karen Liller, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Marshall. We are very excited to be with you today to bring you this ASPPH webinar on program planning and evaluation and on collaboration and partnerships. We both will be providing information throughout the webinar, and I am going to start. So if we could have the next slide, please. So this is our presentation outline for today. First of all, we're going to ask a few questions, and then we're going to review important planning concepts and terms. For example, things like needs assessment, stakeholders, VAMOSA, which stands for vision, mission, objectives, strategies, and actions, generalized planning model, specific planning models, and types of program evaluation. We will then be asking you more questions throughout, and then you'll be able to apply what you've learned through a case study. Next slide, please. Then we'll be doing a presentation of concepts and collaboration and partnerships, concepts and theories, getting to outcomes, mobilization, and then again, applying what you've learned through a case study. Next slide, please. So let's begin with our first question for program planning. Which of the following statements are correct in reference to program planning? A, needs assessments are mostly done midway through to check success of the program. B, the vision statement needs to describe exactly what your group is going to do. C, process objectives describe what your final health outcomes should be. And D, Action plans help groups specify how objectives will be accomplished. So let's take a few minutes now. We'll wait while you jot down your answer to this question. Okay, next slide. Well, if you pick D, you were correct. As we go through the webinar, we'll also provide reasons to you why the other answers are incorrect. For example, choice A is incorrect as needs assessment need to be done early in the process of program planning and they can be done throughout. Choice B was not correct as the vision statement describes the values and hopes of a program or organization. It is how your program would look if it was like the best it could be. And choice C is not correct as process objectives are not about final outcomes but they assess program implementation. Next slide, please. So let's try another question. We're gonna talk about the pre-seed, proceed planning model in more detail in a few minutes, but let's see what you know about it now. Which phase of the pre-seed, proceed planning model addresses the determination of the health problem you're going to work on and related behavioral and environmental determinants? Choice A, social assessment. B, educational slash ecological assessment. C, epidemiological assessment, and D, administrative and policy assessment. So we'll just take a few minutes again for you to jot down your answer. Again, A, social assessment, B, educational, C, epidemiological, and D, administrative and policy. Okay, next slide, please. Well, that answer was C. The other answers are incorrect because they describe other phases and processes of the model. For example, social assessment is about quality of life. We'll be talking about this more in a moment. Determining what factors need to change in your program is part of the educational ecological assessment. And the administrative and policy assessment deals just with that, administrative issues and policy. So that answer was epidemiological assessment. Next slide. So let's now talk about some program planning concepts. First of all, needs and resource assessments. And I'm sure you've learned in your classes or in your jobs that this is really important to do before planning a program because you are identifying, analyzing, and prioritizing what the true needs of a population are. And with this, you also need stakeholder involvement and feedback, which is critical people who are instrumentally involved in the development and implementation of your program, because they will work with you to develop the vision, the mission, 
the objectives, the strategies, and actions. So once again, the MOSA that we talked about earlier. Next slide. And also, we all know that objectives are so important. Objectives guide your program. They answer questions like who, what, how much, and by when. And we'll show you an example of this in a minute. And they should also be what we call SMART, which means specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time limited. So let's look at an example I put together from a program I did a few years ago. Let's see if we can find who, what, how much, and by when. Bicycle helmet use will increase. That's the what for your program. That's what's going to happen often begins, as you know, with an action verb increase. Among whom? Among children ages five to 11. And how much of an increase are we gonna see? By 25% and by when? By the end of the program. So you can see you have the who, the children, the what, the increase in the helmet use, the how much by 25%, and the by when by the end of the program. So once you have your objectives, you'll be start thinking, and we'll talk about this too a little bit later, the strategies you want to use to reach your objectives. In the case of our program, we use much community outreach, school involvement, a social marketing campaign as well. And you also, also want to have an action plan. Your action plan details who's going to do what, when, what's going to be needed, what barriers they may face, and who might be the collaborators, and much more. So action plans are very, very important. Next slide, please. So let's practice now. I always like to, in my classes and in webinars, to try to get people to practice as much as possible. So let's write a SMART objective, once again, for an injury prevention program, but this time it's focused on increasing swimming skills in children. So you can try to think this through, and I can give you an example of one I did, and this actually was a project that we did. Children, that's the who, in the program, increase their swimming skills, once again, that's the what, by how much, by 50%, by when, by the end of the program. So that objective has all the necessary components, the who, the children, the what, they increase their skills, how much, 50%, by when, by the end of the program. So my advice to you is if you know how to write objectives, you only get better at this by writing more objectives. So I would say keep doing this, make sure who, what, how much, and by when, make sure they're smart, and these will be very important to you as you evaluate your program. Next slide, please. So a question I always get from students and others is there are so many planning models out there, which one should I use? Well, first of all, as you think about your planning model, you want to have a planning committee. Absolutely. And who should be on the committee? Members of the population you're trying to reach or the people who are at risk. Definitely the people whom the program is for, because they will tell you as you develop your program what's going to work with that population or not. And you perhaps cannot find this information in the literature necessarily, but by having the people there, they will be able to help. And people who care about the program and will be performing duties, the people who will be working with you, they should definitely be on the committee. They'll tell you about their um, activities, what they're going to do. You'll be able to inform them, so they're important as well. And of course, people who have influence, people are going to have influence, whether they're in the community or the agency, whether they're key leaders or organizational sponsors, the next group, all of these people are important members of a planning committee. So now, what is the general model of planning? In a few minutes, I'm going to give you examples of planning models. We're gonna talk about a variety of them. We're gonna concentrate on pre-seed, proceed, and intervention mapping, but here's what I can tell you. Generally, all of these planning models have these six steps. If you know these six steps, you essentially know the planning models. The first one, take stock of your community. That's the first thing you wanna do. Do not rush to your program. Do not rush to figuring out the major health issue or the objectives. First of all, do a situational analysis, which is basically look at the situation around you. Where, does, where is the community? What are the factors affecting the community? And I always like to tell students to do asset mapping. And 
Asset mapping is when you look at what are the positive strengths in the community. I think so much in public health, we worry about the deficits all the time, what's lacking. But you have to understand that people, as they live in communities, they have strengths. And it may be many organizations, it may, may be the collaborations that are formed between private and, and non-private and profit and non-profit um, organizations. And what I usually do in, in my classes in planning, I have the students do a SWOT analysis for the area and the group they wanna work with. And as you may know, SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What you'll want to assess are what are the strengths and weaknesses of your community or of your population, and those are internal to the group. And then you also will want to assess what are the opportunities from the outside or the threats from the outside that may be affecting them. It could be funding, it could be different policy changes, but it's from the outside. And taking a look at the internal and the external factors really helps in taking stock of your community. And you also want to have, number two, a good understanding of needs now. And this will be greatly helped from the first step here, but you can also do formal needs assessments and resource assessments as well. And after that point, you can begin to set goals and objectives that, again, are realistic, relevant, smart. We already talked about that. And the difference between a goal and your objectives, we saw before how objectives are very detailed. Goals are much broader. Goals are broad statements of intent. So for example, back to the drowning example or back to the swimming skills, we could say that the goal for that program was to decrease drownings in a community and an objective or a way to do that would be to increase swimming skills. And then you wanna develop your intervention. Developing the intervention will work better if it's based on some good theory and logic. And then you wanna implement the intervention and then you evaluate the results. So essentially, you take stock of your community, you understand your needs, you set those goals and objectives, you create the intervention, do it and evaluate it. If you can do those steps, that is the motto of planning. Next slide, please. So, but let's talk about some planning models that have existed previously and ones that are still used today. There are so many of these. We selected in the review book that um, was mentioned to you earlier, uh, these ones because they have been used so heavily in public health and in health education. And this is, for example, Patch. In 1983, it was created. It means planned approach to community health. And this was a CDC uh, model in partnership with state and local health departments and local communities to work on community health problems. After PATCH, APEX Public Health, 1987. That stands for Assessment Protocol for Excellence in Public Health. This was done a lot for health departments and it included CDC, APHA, and NACHO, the National Association of County and City Health Officials. But APEX Public Health was replaced by, next slide please, a model you may be more familiar with called MAP. I know that we teach this here at the University of South Florida College of Public Health. It stands for Mobilizing for Action Through Planning and Partnerships. And you can see a, a figure of the actual model there. So, so how this works is, and again, I would ask you to keep thinking back to that general model of planning, because as I go through these, you know, you'll say yes. I see it, I see it here, and I also see it in the general model. One of the first things they do is organize for success. You know what they're doing? They're getting together, they're getting who are the players involved, they're developing their partnerships, the first thing. They're getting their groups, their committees, and then they're visioning. They're determining what is the vision going to be for this particular uh, endeavor. And then they do what's called four map assessments. Four map assessments really take a look at the community and the public health system for the direction they want to go. They do a community themes and strengths assessment. They look at what's going on in the community. They look at how the local public health system operates or the local public health system assessment. They then look at their health status in the community and that's called community health status assessment. And then they look at what are the forces of change that are coming upon us. So you can see all of these assessments surround this particular diagram. From the assessments, they are able to generate their strategic issues, the issues 
that they are going to want to work on um, in that organization. They then formulate their goals and strategies. And once they do that, they move into action, they plan, they implement, they evaluate. And essentially it is the general model of planning with some other terms, but that's what they're doing. They're developing direction, they're planning, they're implementing, they're evaluating. Next slide, please. Okay, here's another model, map it. Map it was developed, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2010 to allow communities to implement their adaptation of Healthy People 2020. When Healthy People 2020 came out, it's not that you can directly implement that in your community. So the adaptations they were able to do became known as Map It. And the steps, you'll probably be able to see the general planning model here again. Mobilize their group, assess what's going on, plan that intervention, implement, and they say track. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now we have to talk about the two planning models that I teach predominantly in my program planning course here at this college. This is Pre-Seed, Proceed, and a newer model, Intervention Mapping. So let's talk about Pre-Seed, Proceed. Well, I teach a whole semester of Pre-Seed, Proceed in the planning course, so obviously we can't do that today in this short webinar, so I'm going to try to go over some of the essential points. Uh, Pre-Seed Proceed got developed in the 70s, and as you know, the creators Larry Green and Marshall Kruder were instrumental to the success of this model. Um, today, it is in its uh, last and I believe final version, but it's made up of phases. And as you take a look at the phases in the model, we'll see it in a minute. The thing about Pre-Seed Proceed is that you sort of start at the end, right? You start at quality of life where you want to end up, and you actually work your way back to the actual model and the planning. So phase one is called social assessment, and this is where you assess quality of life. This is where you ask communities about their life, about what makes them happy to get up in the morning, what, what, what makes them feel content, what makes them feel discontent. You don't necessarily have to deal with health issues at this point. This, while health is important to quality of life, at this point, you are assessing their entire quality of life. So I always tell my students, do not focus, do not ask them about diabetes at this point, or do not ask them about heart disease. Find out about their quality of life. Because in phase two, the epidemiological assessment is where from those quality of life indicators, you will be able to assess leading health issues and the related behavioral, genetic, and environmental issues. Next slide, please. Phase three, after you have your health issue and what, what behaviors that you hope to change to improve that health issue, which you in turn helps improve the quality of life, um, and you know the environmental factors, you're now going to work on the educational and ecological assessment. And it is in this phase that some very important factors are discussed. And these are the predisposing factors the reinforcing factors and the enabling factors. And also it's important to think about theory at this point. It's, it's important throughout, but it really comes to play in this phase. As you take a look at these factors, I think you understand why. Because predisposing factors, when you assess this for your population, these are the knowledge, the attitudes and beliefs they have that will predispose them to change. You have to know where they're at and how you want knowledge to change and maybe how you want beliefs to change. And then you wanna look at enabling factors, what resources they have and new skills may be needed to bring about the behavior change. And then of course, after behavior happens, we know about reinforcement, how important it is. That's your feedback and reward system. So you hope the behavior continues. So this is where all of this is assessed. So phase four is administrative and policy assessment and a new version here, Pre-Seed, Proceed. He's also added intervention alignment. These are the educational strategies you'll develop that will align with your population and your group. But really important in this phase is you have to determine what administrative issues are at play for your program, what policies are in play, and your budgets. Your budgets are really critical here and your resources. And so this is a really, really important phase because this is where you plan out 
um, how much money, what resources you may need, and is administration going to be favorable to this program? Are the policies in place? And the more alike you are with the administrative and policy factors, the better. Next slide, please. And then phase five. So you have your program sort of put together. You're now going to do a program implementation. You're going to implement it. And then, of course, phases six through eight are extremely important, program evaluation. And although program evaluation is coming in here later, actually this whole evaluation process started at the beginning, right? As you were evaluating the community with a needs assessment. But at this phase, we term program evaluation after it's been implemented. And you look, you go from the most immediate part of program evaluation or process and generally this follows the tenant, is the program implemented as planned? You're looking at the process of how it runs. Through the impact evaluation, did your knowledge change? Did your attitudes change, your beliefs, your behaviors? These are the environmental changes, right? Did those change? You wrote objectives for those. To the farthest outcome evaluation, and this is ultimately what you want, but understand this may take many years before you're able to see changes here. And this is the health change and the quality of life. Next slide, please. So here it is. Here is the model that I'm sure if you've had a course in planning, you lived and died with uh, for many, many weeks in a semester. I know my students do with my planning course. So again, you begin in phase one, but if you look at this model, right, that sort of seems you're at the end, but you're actually starting with quality of life. And from that, you discover your health issue. And then with your health issue, what behaviors you have to work on, what environmental factors. And then from these, what's going to predispose this population to these changes? What's going to reinforce them? What's going to enable them? And then phase four, you put it all together in an intervention and you do some administrative and policy assessments, as I mentioned. Phase five on the side there, you're going to implement and then here comes the evaluation phases with process being how is this program running to impact? Am I changing behavior? Am I changing the environment? Am I changing the predisposing, enabling and reinforcing factors? And then finally, the outcome evaluation. Am I changing health? Did health improve? Did quality of life improve? And throughout these phases, keep in mind you are writing objectives. You're writing an objective for the health change, the quality of life, the behavior changes, the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling. And there's several ways you figure out which behavior you're going to focus on for a health issue or what environmental factor. You often look at how important these things are and how changeable they are. So there are all kinds of ways to figure out the direction to go. But once again, if you look at the precede proceed model, it is very much so still following our general model of planning, which we're basically figuring out the situation, we're zeroing in on the health issues and the behaviors, we're planning our program, we're implementing it, and we're evaluating it. Next slide, please. So, Pre-seed, pro-seed has been around for a long time. It's been tested in a variety of ways in schools and communities and health settings. But I really, really like a newer model that has come on the scene with it called intervention mapping. And the reason why I like this model is because it expands upon pre-seed, pro-seed and other planning models because it does provide, I think, better guidance, especially in intervention components. While pre-seed, pro-seed will tell you, yes, these are the elements you may want to include in your intervention, how you exactly do that can be difficult. So that's where intervention mapping steps in. And also, it clearly shows the use of theory. So how does intervention mapping work? Well, it starts with actually using pre-seed, pro-seed. They call it a logic model of the problem. And essentially what they're doing, they are discovering what health issue is important, what behaviors, what environmental features. That's what they're doing. They're using pre-seed, pro-seed. But in step two, they call it program outcomes and objectives. At that point, they begin writing their objectives as you do in pre-seed, pro-seed. And they call this point the logic model of change because they want to use change objectives at this point. And this is where you write about behavior change. This is where you write about knowledge change. Next slide. 
And then step three, we do program design. And it's a very great uh, tool to know how to put together a good program. And then four, to produce the program. And five, to develop an implementation plan. Not just you're going to implement the program, but definitely steps behind how you will successfully implement this. And number six, developing an evaluation plan. The central focus of intervention mapping, what I really liked about it, is because it does involve community and planning groups. And you could say, well, yes, but every planning model does that. Well, they really do this very detailed throughout the process. And what's so interesting about intervention mapping is that these community groups are not there just to be there, just to be there and say, yes, I've included this particular group because I felt I needed to. They do brainstorming along with the program planners in each planning step. And that, I think, makes it different. Next slide, please. So. Once we have our planning models, we now want to think about the program itself. You know, we said it just doesn't happen magically. Intervention mapping will help you through a lot of this. But the question I always get is, well, I've decided, let's say, that diabetes is my health issue and I really want to change behaviors. I want to increase exercise. I want to improve diet as maybe some of my behaviors for the environmental change. I want to work with the community to see if we can get better options for healthy foods in stores and things like that. And that is fine. So then he say, now I'm ready to go with my intervention, but there's something very similar that was done, like what I wanna do. So can I just take that intervention and say, it is now my intervention. Well, it's important, yes, to identify existing evidence-based intervention, and my emphasis is on evidence-based. There's a lot of programs out there, but you want to make sure that it's been evaluated and there's evidence behind it to adopt, or you can adapt for your population. And that is probably a good thing to think about rather than jumping into a brand new intervention, because as you may know, these can be expensive and time consuming, but I must leave you with a caveat here. Do not adopt or adapt a program that's not right. It's not a fit. It just doesn't work with your population. Perhaps, you know, it was done with different age groups. It was done in a different part of the country that had different materials to work with, or it was a different environment. Be very careful here. Make sure that you can see enough there that is similar to yours that you can either perhaps adopt or adapt. Next slide, please. So where can you find examples of evidence-based intervention? Well, of course, in the review book, we have these sites listed. Um, and also the guide to community preventative services is also excellent. But also if you're interested in cancer-related um, programs, here is the National Cancer Institute programs. Uh, CDC's HIV interventions, again, these are only examples. SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices as well. So many, many are out there. Next slide, please. However, if you decide to adapt an existing program, now you decide, well, this program does match mine pretty well, but I am gonna have to adapt a little bit because maybe the age group isn't perfect or maybe the racial ethnic breakdown is a little different or maybe the socioeconomic status is different however you can do that you can begin to adapt a program but here is what you have to remember anything new you create materials programs you need to pretest those please because you have now changed that program it is not the same program you might have pulled off the shelf or got from other materials so when you create your final version please, please pre-test, and then I would highly recommend you pilot test the entire intervention. So as you go through interventions, you will find that they have many strategies and methods as you read them, and sometimes people get confused what's the difference, and even the folks who have been program planning a long time, it gets confusing to all of us. But generally, when you think of a strategy, that's sort of a broad general plan of action you take. It can involve many different activities and considers the population, whereas your method is going to be the approach you take to reach your target. 
and it's used by presenters, health educators, or others, you know, whether or not you're doing a small group discussion, you're doing a lecture, a skill-based training, you know, but your strategy is some of your broader ways to go about this, whereas methods are more detailed. Next slide, please. So where do I consult information about appropriate strategies and methods? Well, again, we give you an example here out of the intervention mapping book. And by the way, that and this is an article on it, but it's also, there is a book, Intervention Map, uh, Mapping by Dr. Bartholomew Eldridge, that is excellent. And also, of course, our review guide there has information as well. So here's another question. Pilot testing and intervention on a small scale is important. True or false? I bet everybody's gonna get this correct. All right, and if we hit the, there you go. True, pilot testing, and why is that important? And by the way, when you test an intervention, it's called pilot testing. When you test materials, it's generally called pre-testing. But pilot testing can save time, money, and resources, right? And reduce the chances of program failure because you will learn very quickly on a pilot what's going right and what's going wrong. Then you can fix it before you do the rollout. So. What is the term used to test if the program is being implemented as planned? That's something you wanna make sure, right? Because you go to all the effort of creating an intervention based on planning models, right, and testing, and then you put it out there and you wanna make sure that as it gets done, it gets done as planned. So what is that term? Think about that. Well, it's called fidelity of implementation. Fidelity or faithfulness. In other words, the it was implemented as set forth. Next slide, please. Okay, another question. Here's a question I commonly get. Well, if fidelity is important, how can I do that? How can I make sure that a program I develop will be implemented as planned? Well, there are several ways. Maybe think about that for a minute. And, okay, let's show you a way. Well. This is one way I definitely think is important, training and observation of your staff, right? Because these are the people who are going to be doing the program. So you have to make sure that your staff are appropriately trained and you keep assessing the program activities. You're looking at materials, you're looking at um, information they provide you about people who came and how things went, but they themselves are ready to do this program. Don't shortchange yourself on this because it can really break a program. So this is something that I've added to my classes on uh, planning and also evaluation. And this is this concept of sustainability. So many times we in public health and in health education go in and we do programs and once we leave and the funding leaves, so does the program. And that's sad, especially in a community that has grown to love the program or participate in the program, and all of a sudden it's gone. It doesn't do anything to build trust among you, your group, and the people in the community. So when you plan your program, you are not just planning a program for today, but you have to plan for how that program can be sustained over time. And this is one of the reasons I really, really like intervention mapping, because that information and intervention mapping has exemplary guidance, especially in the book, on how to ensure, ensure the sustainability of your program. And I often don't see this with other planning models. Next slide. So what do we mean by this? Ensuring sustainability is not easy. It's not that you go and you try to make sure money lasts or whatever. This is actually preparing planning models like you've just done for your health issue, but it's not for the people at risk. It is for those who have the ability to continue your programs after you and your funding are gone. These are for the program administrators, the policy folks, the budget, the management. These are the people that are going to maintain this program after you're gone. And they don't need to necessarily know about diabetes or the health issue. They need to know about the program. How much money is it going to take? How can we sustain the funding? Tell me about the management principles you're following. So it's, it's all about your program, not about your health issue per se. And you actually do planning models and you educate those folks 
who can sustain your program on these issues. So now we're going to talk about evaluation in more detail, and I'm going to turn over the presentation to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Jennifer Marshall. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about program evaluation and how that is interrelated with program planning. Um, and really, ideally, that evaluation is happening from the beginning, including all of those steps that Dr. Lillard just mentioned. So the CDC defines evaluation as a systematic investigation of the merit, worth, or significance of a program. And that is the many reasons why an evaluation might be conducted. So there are many, uh, the purpose of the evaluation can really vary. It could be to help develop a program, to look at the design. It could be to uh, assess implementation of a program or to identify some of the outcomes or benefits of the program or even how that program contributes to the broader context of the community. So um, the evaluator can actually be part of that planning team from the very beginning. There are three general types of evaluation I'll go through. These are aligned with the different reasons or the purpose of the evaluation. So they are formative, which is prior to implementation of the program, process, which is during implementation, and summative, looking after implementation at the effects of the program. Next. So the formative evaluation is used to assess the need for the program, what type of program might be best suited to address that need. It may be used as part of the development of the program, pilot testing materials and approaches, community assessment or that situation analysis mentioned earlier can be part of formative evaluation. Next. Process evaluation addresses implementation of the program. So is the program being carried out in the way that it was designed? And is the program reaching the intended population? Who are the participants of the program? So this really unpacks the implementation, how the program's operating. Next. The summative evaluation is really evaluation of whether the program met the goals and objectives that we talked about earlier. So the short-term, mid-term, long-term outcomes of the program. Next. So we also, not only do we have planning models, but we have evaluation models. And CDC's Six Steps to Evaluation, I think, is a wonderful framework that's very helpful. Um, so we're going to go through these steps now. The first step is stakeholder engagement. We'll talk about this throughout the, the rest of today's presentation. But what I recommend that is that before even beginning or designing your evaluation, you list all possible stakeholders. That includes the participants and implementers of the program, those who might be affected by the program. That includes other community partners who conduct similar programs in the community. It could be the program funders or others who are interested in that health issue or the specific population that you're working with. So part of stakeholder engagement is determining the priorities and the evaluation questions that are relevant to each of those people. So engaging them now at the very beginning will help you throughout all the subsequent phases of your evaluation. Step two is another really important piece of background work and kind of an ongoing process, and that is being able to describe the program fully. So in fact, many of the programs that you may evaluate or that I encounter don't have an explicit theory of change or a logic model. They haven't gone through that detailed series of program planning steps. Often they are, sometimes programs are funded to conduct a set of activities toward a broad or a vague outcome. So the process evaluation helps the program to connect the dots you know, from the inputs to the activities to those uh, goals and objectives that will lead to the outcome. So you need to be able to describe also the program within the broader context of the community, what's known about the health issue that the program's trying to address. The third step, sorry, it's a little cut off here, but you can see that's focusing the evaluation design. So that's based on what you know about the size and scope of the program the stakeholders, prioritized evaluation questions, 
balancing this with the gold standards of research. So choosing methods and measures that have the most objectivity, credibility, validity, reliability. You have to balance your gold standards for research design with feasibility for the program. So will you have a comparison or control group? Do you have a longitudinal design? It's a cohort study. Often you're very limited on what you can do at first, but always thinking about uh, uh, research design to come up with a rigorous evaluation. Also, when you're designing the evaluation, you need to address the burden of the evaluation on staff and administrators, as well as participants of the program. So when designing the program, you use your research training, as well as the stakeholder engagement to come together and create an evaluation that's amenable to everyone. You also want to think about your evaluation resources. Do you have the time, the staff, the expertise, and the funds to support them? The fourth step is gathering credible evidence. It's tempting as researchers sometimes to collect a lot of data, but that may not be feasible. That may be a high burden on the program. Um, however, the data that is already collected by a program may or may not be of the highest quality. It may not be reliable. It may not be complete. You might not have sufficient numbers uh, to really do an analysis. So when you're gathering credible evidence at this stage, you make a determination. You look at the existing data and determine whether you need to collect new or additional data, determine the best way to collect and use those data that minimizes burden, maximizes validity. And this can be done through qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods. Once these data are collected and analyzed, you justify the conclusions that are drawn from your evalu evaluation. And this is where it's really good to member check your results. They can help you to interpret your findings. And then finally, the sixth and the last step is disseminating your results to all of the stakeholders. So this means if you have not designed an evaluation upfront that answers the questions that are the priorities of your program implementers and stakeholders, sadly, your results may not be relevant or particularly interesting to them. So remember, as an evaluator, the program and the sponsors of the evaluation and even the participants of the evaluation or of the program, these are your customers. We want to make sure that we have questions of interest to them and that we're able to develop a dissemination plan that matches each of the audiences within your stakeholder list and their interests and priorities. That way we can make sure the key messages and recommendations are received by them and more likely to be used. Next slide. So you can see here um, from this slide that you need to be able to clearly describe your methods and that these reports are tailored to different stakeholders with clear, simple, action-oriented recommendations. Next. Okay. The CDC framework also has these four standards. I think they're really helpful. The first is utility. That just asks if the evaluation is useful to all your stakeholders that I listed before. Secondly, is the evaluation feasible? The scope and activities are reasonable based on your, the expectations and resources the program has and your highest standards for research, as well as the resources you have as an evaluator. The third standard is propriety, which means your evaluation's been designed and implemented ethically following human subjects research guidelines. Informed consent, voluntary participation, confidentiality, minimal risk. And finally, accuracy. So again, we think about standards for well-designed research. Have you established validity and reliability and maximize that in your data collection and analysis? These standards are really wonderful and the framework's wonderful because it provides the evaluator a guide to make sure all these considerations are included in rigorous evaluation design and implementation. And it also helps to explain what you're doing to the stakeholders in a way that they can understand. All right, next slide. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. This is uh, Dr. Liller again. I'm gonna take the first case study because it has to deal somewhat with program planning. Um, so here it is, Susie Smith has been hired by the local health department to develop a health promotion program on decreasing diabetes among minority middle-aged adults. 
The county where Susie works has 5,000 residents, of which 50% are African American, 20% are Hispanic, and 30% identify as Caucasian. So before we advance to the next slide, keep in mind that we are talking again about a program. They have decided already that it is a diabetes issue and hopefully before they've gone there, they have done some type of needs assessment and they've assessed that's the most important health issue. Um, and we are going to do this program for minority middle-aged adults. Okay, next slide, please. So what should Susie's first steps be? Using the Precede Proceed model, outline a program plan for her and plans for evaluation, assuming those first steps, as I just mentioned, the discovery of diabetes and the group they're working on, they've already been done. So kind of think through, you know, if that's the population and that's the health issue, how, what might my program look up like? What might some of the behavior changes be? The environmental changes? How do you think I might be able to reach this population? And also, how would I evaluate this program that we just heard from Dr. Marshall? What about process? What about impact? And what about outcome evaluations? So just think about that for a minute, and we'll just wait for a few seconds for you to think that through. Of course, you would have much longer if you were actually planning this program and evaluating it. Okay, next slide, let's get some ideas. Well, I would think for suggested responses, you know, first of all, this program plan is going to involve strategies and methods that are best going to reach this population. Now this population is middle-aged adults, many are um, going to be from minority groups and we're dealing with diabetes. So you may think about an educational seminar but I would say for you, since it is adult, you want to use some principles of adult learning, which is basically you want them to practice what you're saying and they have to see relevant. So I would say much hands-on learning. You want to use their experience to help guide you in your presentation. Teaching adults is very different than teaching children. So you need to be able to utilize the experience of your group, listen to them, Probably social media, I would say, because many, many folks use that now. I would definitely pull in social media to educate and reinforce the positive behaviors and more. And I would also be thinking about what objectives I'm going to be covering. And again, that would be based off my needs assessment. That would also be based off as I learn about the population through secondary data, as well as primary data I might be collecting. You might be going at exercise, you might be dealing with um, and making sure insulin is used properly, you may be dealing with better eating habits. So there's a variety of ways you can go uh, in terms of the behaviors. Next slide, please. So how would you evaluate this program? Well, as you did this program, whether it was small group discussions or whether it was you're assessing there how many times they used your social media posts, you would need to do process evaluation. And that would say, how am I going to be sure the program was implemented as planned? Well, if I'm doing discussions with this group and I'm hiring health educators, I definitely want to train and educate these health educators in how this program runs, how they can reach the population. You may have to go back and actually talk about with your instructors and with your facilitators all about diabetes, some questions they may get from the group. And then of course you are gonna to wanna to assess impact and outcome because you are gonna to wanna to see hopefully some knowledge changes within your group, the behavior changes. And eventually, now again, this may take years, but eventually as you continue to do the program, hopefully, and it's sustained as we talked about, we will go on and see, has diabetes gone down? Have the rates gone down? Has their quality of life increased? And using the Precede Proceed model, you can definitely do this. You can assess their quality of life in the beginning and then continue to do that as years go by, hopefully for your program or even one year 
um, you may not see much change there or in rates, but it, hopefully if you only have a year program, you'll be able to see changes in behaviors and attitudes and knowledge and those types of things. Next slide, please. So here again is the model, and this is the one definitely I would use as the backbone of, of many of your planning activities. It fits to the general model of planning. Began as precede, proceed. As I said before, intervention mapping also expands upon this with really helping with sustainability, intervention components, and theory. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So now we have an opportunity to talk about collaboration and partnerships, which is so important, right? I've mentioned that several times, and Dr. Marshall will take you through this information. So when we think about uh, program planning and implementation and evaluation, who are, who are the folks that are planning and implementing and evaluating uh, these programs? These are our community partners, especially when we think about community level change. So the fact is these programs don't exist in isolation. They're part of a broader context. I always say context is everything. I think about context in terms of the socio-political, the demographic, the epidemiological, and the services and resources landscape. So there's a lot of complexity going on in communities. So if you can establish these strong partnerships and collaborations in a community, half of your work is done. When you're dealing with long-standing or complex health issues or problems, or if you're dealing with emergency situations, such as epidemics or natural disasters, having these pre-established collaborations and partnerships, coalitions that meet regularly, is a key to the quick and coordinated response and better outcomes. Next. So let's start with our definition of community, which is any group of people who share a common identity, values, goals, institutions. This could be a community that's defined by its geography. That's our traditional definition of community. Uh, people and organizations who operate within specific zip codes or neighborhoods or cities, geographic boundaries. But it also could be widely dispersed geographically, uh, people and entities who share cultural or social boundaries. Next. Just like there are planning and evaluation models, there are models for collaboration. And uh, they also serve that purpose for structuring your activities. Um, communication or community coalition action theory is a great framework. I love this one. It describes well how collaborations occur. Um, there are other um, theoretical frameworks. So collective impact framework is another one. We're going to talk about community coalition action theory. And again, when you look at different theoretical frameworks for collaboration, you will see similarities across all of them. Um, this theory uh, includes stages for the coalition life cycle, how coalitions form, how they're maintained and institutionalized for long-term collaboration and how they evolve over time. It also describes members' engagement and consensus building efforts and components that should be attended to. Um, so you can see the model here. And this is a, a visual model like this is great for conveying uh, to your own coalition and also to external stakeholders really uh, what the coalition collaboration looks like. And it also can help when you're measuring collaboration. Uh, sometimes we evaluate that. You can see here that community context, the leadership and membership, the processes and infrastructure, the relationships, it's called synergy in that box in the center. You can see it to the right implementation and outcomes. And then below um, are the stages of development. There are arrows because these stages are iterative because the members and the leaders, as well as the community context change over time. So coalitions, um, again, kind of have iterative life cycles. These visual representations help us conceptualize the important steps that need to be followed and those key ingredients or components that research has shown make a difference and contribute to success in achieving shared goals. Next slide. 
So who are these partners? We talked quite a bit about stakeholders, those individuals who represent organizations, systems, community groups. Um, so keep in mind, informal roles also are important. These are your stakeholders, but there are also other types of partners. Um, so think, in, think about um, gatekeepers. Who are the decision makers or ha that have the power to support or block efforts to make change in communities? A gatekeeper also can be a member of a community or an organization that's embedded within the community that can help have access to the priority population. Um, it could be an agency that funds or uh, manages other initiatives in the community. So gatekeepers are the folks that you want to identify and engage when you're um, trying to solicit community change. Also, there are opinion leaders. So these are the folks who can inform collaborative efforts or initiatives and support them also. I think of these people as the champions, champions for a priority population or champions for a particular health issue or for a particular community. Next slide. So here are a set of uh, collaboration and partnership tips. Um, again, those planning models that we went through help you to remember a lot of these tips. Um, so when you're working in collaboration with community partners, it takes time to kind of hone your mutually agreed upon vision, to collect everyone's opinions, to decide upon the verbiage that resonates with everyone in the group. So it takes a little bit of time to develop that shared vision. The same goes for determining the best strategy or approach kind of overall. So ideally you come up with a range of ideas about next steps and then decide together on where to start. So there's several ways to come to consensus within a group. And then you, if you have a list of change ideas or kind of potential ideas, you can make adjustments as you go. Third, you need to have diverse perspectives. So sometimes not everyone is in the same room. That's ideal and that's convenient, but not always realistic because the days, the times, the places to meet don't always work for everyone or are comfortable for everyone because we really want diverse multiple perspectives. So there may be community residents whose input you'll need to get individually or a smaller coalition of residents who designate a representative to be part of these larger, more formal meetings. However, those multiple perspectives are gathered, you do need to create a way to engage everyone and to communicate across the board using methods and strategies really can be within a communication plan that's consistent and accessible to your whole range of stakeholders. So it's not enough to just have a monthly meeting. You really need to have um, ways to solicit a broad range of perspectives. So also, um, determining roles and responsibilities, th that's a, an important piece um, for moving forward and achieving outcomes. Um, and this may be communicated in meeting minutes. It could be in your formalized community plan. And it could be in formal interagency agreements or MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding between agencies. So there are many ways to, to determine the roles and responsibilities and then to communicate those out so everyone is really clear in that community plan. Most importantly, I think Dr. Liller went through this, it's important for community collaboration and partnership to be sustainable. The leadership needs to be diverse and to be um, supported and generated and representative of the community and the population that's involved not just whomever is funded to do the work that particular year. So coalitions could be short-term or ad hoc work groups, but typically coalitions consist of partnerships that have developed over years, if not decades. Next slide. So I have a few more terms that I think are helpful to know. Um, First of all, if you want to have community capacity, I actually don't have that up there, but capacity, your skills, your resources, your relationships to accomplish those shared goals, you might need to start with community development. So community development focuses on building capacity, starting with group identity, okay? Say you have a planning group, you've developed that group, the identity, the cohesion, 
community organizing is just that. It's organizing the people, the ideas, the resources, the goals into a coherent plan. Then we move to community mobilization to address problems or needs. And sometimes a social planning model is used. Again, we have different types of uh, community planning models, program planning models. The social planning model focuses on bringing experts in from the outside to support and structure the efforts I was just talking about. Also, many of our efforts in public health, especially when we think about health disparities, social justice, disenfranchised communities, we end up using a social action approach which may include advocacy and policy changes at the local level and beyond the local level to address some long-standing or root causes of health issues in a given community. So knowing these terms I think is helpful because when you're working in a community, you're going to start recognizing some of these and then you'll have an idea of how the community process is orienting or at what stage it's developing. Next slide. So this kind of revisits what I was talking about um, with community mobilization. If we bring this all together today, Dr. Lillo took you through some planning steps and models, and the, I took you through those corresponding evaluation steps. But that community engagement and partnership is the fabric of relationships that allows for program development, planning, and evaluation to occur within the context of a, of a given community. So that makes it more relevant, more tailored to the priority population. It makes these programs more effective and more sustainable. Next slide. So remember Susie, who we were talking about a few minutes ago, who's working with the local health department to develop this health promotion program, right, to decrease diabetes among minority and middle-aged adults. Um, so let's think about this in terms of community partnerships, okay? So she um, has brought the um, health department that's funding and sponsoring the work and some other community leaders um, to the table. So take a moment to think about who else should have been invited to the table or should be invited to the table. Okay, next slide. We're not giving you a ton of time here to jot down your answers, but, um, but yes, you wanna think about all of those folks that I just mentioned. So anyone who's important to the success of the program, who has a stake in the outcomes of this program, who cares about diabetes, who cares about the priority population, other community members and agencies who are involved in this health issue, the medical community, faith leaders, community organizations that might be part of implementation. Um, anyone who is a gatekeeper, an opinion leader, or a stakeholder um, in the outcomes of this project. Next slide. So maybe she's got folks all to the table, but she's having difficulty considering one or more objectives. The coalition is having a hard time choosing their objectives. How could she get the coalition to zero in better on the directions for the program? This happens a lot. We have a lot of coalitions or groups, work groups, planning groups that meet to share information but have a hard time getting to the next steps. So after a few disastrous meetings of participants not really focused, wandering on topics, probably building relationships, which is important but doesn't help us move forward, um, she wants to, um, kind of move forward? How can she get things under control so that she can uh, implement and then perform an evaluation? Next slide. This is where it's really helpful for you to revisit some of the models that we shared with you today and the concepts. For her to get things on track, she can use the tools that we've shared with you, the steps to really structure um, the coalition's efforts. 
helping the coalition to, or the group, the planning group, to establish their shared vision, their mission, their goals, to come up with some of those SMART objectives collaboratively, and to develop those roles and responsibilities. She needs to have clear agendas, that kind of implementation structure and in process um, in place, and clear purposes for each meeting outlined. That way, when she can uh, determine and communicate those roles and responsibilities, in addition to the relationship building, that will keep them engaged and get everyone moving in the same direction. Next slide. So this is our final slide. We just want to reiterate that good program planning and evaluation within collaboration and partnerships will really help you to be more effective, more relevant, and more sustained in terms of uh, better health outcomes in the community. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you very questions. much. Thank you very much for joining us today. So questions? Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. So much information, um, very uh, inclusive of, I think, everything that you could possibly cover in an hour and a half. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> we only have uh, one submitted question so far. And again, if you click on that orange um, box with the white arrow, that'll open up your control box and that'll show your question um, dialog box and then you can enter in your questions. So the first question is, which is a best model to use extremely large populations, the match or the precede proceed? Uh, did you mean the map or the precede proceed? It says match in here, but possibly she probably meant map. Okay. Um, which planning model to use? You know, that is always like I, like I when I said before, that always is a question. Well, there are so many to be able to use. And I'll tell you what, I, for a program plan, um, I tend to gravitate toward pre seed pro seed only because that's what I've been essentially trained in and because I think the way that it is set up, making you look broader, first at quality of life and then health issue, and then you know you go back through the arrows and you can see how they all relate, works well. Now, with that being said, that is not a fast model. It, it takes a while. A lot of the decision of which planning model actually happens in the planning committee because sometimes that's dictated by the funder. Sometimes you'll get a funding uh, from a group and they will say, we would like you to utilize a particular approach. And in that case, you'll lean that way. It also has to deal with resources. Because a lot of times, if you don't have a lot of resources to do an extensive review as that, at least you can go back to the general model of planning because that's it. Basically doing a needs assessment, you know, developing your sense of vision, where you want to go, your objectives, then kind of thinking, okay, now that, and the objectives are critical, right? Because that's it. That's what you're going to be measuring for change from the program. Okay, so once you get there, how can we best with, and a lot of time the question is, how can I do this the best, but most efficiently? It may not be the creme de la creme of programs, but you can still get across what you need to do so that objectives change and that health improves. So a lot of it has to do with time and resources and what's dictated sometimes by, by, by the funding agency. So, and, and it also depends on the direction of the program. You know, MAP is a lot, a lot of times used, I know, with health departments and things because they're, they're really looking at the local public health assessment. They're looking at the public health. They're looking at what's going on with the health departments and that sort of thing. And that works well with them to assess how they can reach communities. And sometimes when I just use community planning models, I may lean more on pre-seed, proceed but I don't know if you have any other suggestions, yeah, Dr. Marshall. Yeah, that's what I would add to is I spend time when I'm working with a particular planning group, that set of stakeholders, really where they're at conceptually in, in program planning and kind of their level of experience, um, as well as, yeah, again, the kind of the resources, the time, um, and the culture of the programs that you're working with, that can drive the models that are most 
most clear and understandable. Really, the model is there just to get everyone on the same page. So you just it, it helps if you have quite a few available. When you get to know your, your planning group, then you can see what, what looks like the best fit and makes the most sense to them. It's really there just to guide the group. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, does impact evaluation precedes outcome evaluation or is it the other way around? I'll take this one because this is a, an interesting question because when we did the review guide, I was working with Dr. Marshall and Dr. Armstrong and some other folks and, and I had, prepared that section and I did it so that impact was knowledge, behavior, environmental changes, predisposing factors. I was using how it's defined in the pre-seed, proceed planning model. Outcome was also done for me. That's your final outcome. That's your health and quality of life. However, there are disciplines that reverse that so that the outcome is actually the behavior change, the predisposing, the environmental, and the impact is your final change that you're trying to achieve with health and quality of life. You know, this can be very discipline specific. And the reason why I did it this way in the slides is that's how I was trying to follow the pre-seed, proceed model. Yeah, it's most important. The terminology changes depending on the models that you're using. So I usually tell folks, tell my students to just focus on what are the short term, mid term, mid -term. and long term. Well, outcomes, effects, impacts, however you're going to use that consistently. If you're using pre-seed, proceed, you would use the terms that go with pre-seed, proceed. Right, and, and, and that's a good point, um, Jennifer, about short-term, mid-term, and long-term. You often see that done in the typical logic model approach when you do logic models. I didn't actually show you that. Actually, pre-seed, proceed in and of itself, that's a logic model, essentially, because you have some inputs, you have some outputs, and you have some outcomes. Um, but the short-term changes would be things you can measure quickly, knowledge, it may be a change in, in, in those sorts of things. You know, knowledge you can measure quickly. You can do a pre-post test, get baseline, and then when you're done, do that. And it, or it might be something like that. Midterm changes are kind of like the middle, like behavior, environmental, those things that are getting closer to the long-term changes, which would be health and quality of life. So you kind of look at your, you know, you can look at it that way as well. Um, you know, knowledge is going to be easier to change than a, a behavior change, correct? And then behavior will probably be easier to switch up, but do you get that final health change? You know, is the behavior maintained? That sort of thing. So you finally do get a change in that individual's health or in that population's health. And then finally their quality of life. Great, okay. Um, and then it, here it is, is presence of a comparison group the only difference between impact evaluation and process evaluation? Okay, so the process evaluation is your evaluation of how the program is being implemented. Who is implementing the program? What exactly are they doing? Who is participating in the program? Really, is it being uh, implemented in the way that it was designed to be implemented? So process evaluation is, is an evaluation of the process, the implementation of the program. So that is uh, sometimes, um, uh, for example, there may be group uh, teaching sessions that a program is doing, the workshops. But if they're not specifically training, the trainer is not specifically training uh, increasing knowledge, increasing skills, then it might just be like a support group. We can't really, we, we wouldn't expect to see knowledge and skills changing. So really process evaluation is looking at implementation of the program. The outcome evaluation, summative evaluation, impact evaluation, right? What happens afterwards is looking at the effects on the participants. And I think that, that he's asking, you might have a comparison group then, so like a control group to be able to see yeah. those effects. So your evaluation yeah. design, when I talk about research design, you think about what's the best way to show the impacts of that program on the population, then you want to think about the best way that you can, you can really attribute change to uh, the program's effects. 
And, and if I could just add the process evaluation, you're going to be measuring, you're still going to be measuring things, but you're going to be measuring things like how many people showed up and how many lessons of a particular training or a particular study guide were used and um, how many, you know, I also put satisfaction in here. Some people say satisfaction is an impact measure. I don't really agree because you could be satisfied with something and love how it was done, but not change anything. So it, it could that be um, the dosage, dosage, attrition. attrition. How many people did you lose? That's all process, but it's not really measuring what you were set out to do, which is change knowledge, change attitudes, maybe see changes in behavior. It's just sort of like when you're, I always tell my students, it's like making a cake. Okay. Process is like putting in the butter, putting in the store-bought, because I don't make anything probably myself, putting in from the store, I adding them. That's all process, but that final K is my outcome, right? But my process is all the ingredients mixed in the correct proportions and cooked. So that's an easier way to remember it. Great. Uh, well, currently we don't have any further questions. I think you guys covered it in such great depth and detail that everyone is fully informed and educated. So great job. Um, I did want to go over right before we left uh, just a few of those resources that I talked about and just bring that up. People were asking where they can access um, links to all of this. And that's going to be on the NBPHE website, nbphe.org backslash cph dash study dash resources. Uh, and you can go there and get links to all of this webinar. Um, the PowerPoint presentation is already up there. And then once we have the recording um, downloaded from the webinar provider, we will post that as well, as well as uh, past webinars are up there um, and links to other resources. So uh, let's see. There was an additional question. How do you make sure that a program is being sustained after the intervention? has been done. So we'll probably, uh, this Dr. Lill, or probably both Dr. Marshall and I can answer that. You know, that is, is, is actually sort of, you know, following the program, trying to, although you may have stepped back in terms of being the implementer and the evaluator, and what you, what you want to do now is to see, is that program still going on and checking back to see if they're having success. They will probably get back with you anyway about the program, but the way to ensure sustainability, right, is some of the ways that I already discussed that you literally have to do a plan for this. It is not going to happen just by willy nilly that all of a sudden I do a great program and it's there. People have to own the program as Dr. Marshall was talking about that critical stages of collaboration and partnerships as you plan so important, but not only that, they can work with you, but still they have to know how they can sustain it, how their budgets are going to have to continue this program, how they're going to have to work with management to ensure success. They'll have to know everything about the program. They'll have to know how it works. Where did it come from? Why is it important? Why do people want it in their community? They have to learn the program, but then you have to work with them with a program plan on furthering the program. They will have questions for you. Maybe we won't have the resources. So then you and that group work together to brainstorm where will future resources come from. Maybe it'll be a grant. Maybe it will be a budget actually change in their organization. So they put a line item now in their budget for this program. That's great if they do that. Dr. Marshall. And I've worked with several programs that have done a great job with this. And I think the, the key is having the right stakeholders at the table. Um, coalition building, meaning bringing a work and planning group together that cares about the population, cares about that health issue. And uh, several of the programs I've worked with, either the funder, the initial funder required a sustainability plan, which I think was very mm -hmm. forward thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, and supported that, um, or the work group created a sustainability plan, and those ongoing relationships are what sustain. Some of these programs that I've worked with, they lost their initial funding, but the other partners at the table within those systems of care, they picked up, 
or they all contributed. So that's part of kind of integrating their resources. Um, so I think it's really important if you're working as a public health professional with a coalition, with a community, that's why we say having that stakeholder engagement and identifying who those particular champions are, who those gatekeepers are, who the system level partners are, and also those making sure those are folks that are uh, committed to that community um, are there um, so that the program can continue if that's not the community that you're working from within. Great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> another question submitted to, ins to ensure sustainability is there a logic model that works the best? Uh, this is Dr. Lillard. You know, it's funny in planning, I think people always want like, what's the best? You know, what's the <laughs> best model? And it's really hard. I wouldn't say there's the best. I would tell you to refer to the intervention mapping textbook. Uh, it is called, I believe, Intervention Mapping and by Dr. Bartholomew Eldridge. And she does a great job in outlining what you need actually for sustainability and doing a, and doing a plan. Um, in terms of, of the best approach, I think, you know, just as we're saying, as, as we just heard, talking, the key here is talking about sustainability early. Showing people logic models, absolutely great, because they can see how the program works, but that's not enough. Just seeing how a program works, they'll say, fine. And while you're here and I have your funding, we'll do it. But when you're gone, bye-bye to the program, right? We're not going to sustain it. So it's bigger than that. When you form those collaborations, as we just heard, it talks about budget. It talks about management. Because don't forget, when you walk away, not only money is needed, but people. People are needed to add this to their job description. They're, where do they come from? right, from the organization or the agency, why would they do this for you? They have to see the relevance, they have to be ready to take over when you exit, or if, if you're no, or only part of you is still there, let's say. So there has to be that sense of ownership, I think, that has to be developed with those early partnering. And I really, really recommend a plan a sustainability as we just heard plan or, or how intervention mapping does it because that outlines it very clearly for those people, the administrators, the policy makers, the agency leaders that are gonna have to pick up this program when you're done. And in your logic model, there's a column for inputs and these yes. are your inputs. That's where that fits. That's right. So yes, you're logic models, your people, your partnerships. Right. Yes, and when you, and, and that's important, that's, thank you. When that, that's important because normally when people do logic models, they have inputs, they just think inputs to the program. Money, people, that, they're not thinking, well, okay, that's for my program, but what are the inputs needed for sustainability? How can I sustain that program beyond uh, the time when you may have to leave or your funding leaves? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any further questions submitted. Is there anything else that either of you would like to touch on prior to ending the webinar for today? Any advice for those who are studying for the exam? Um, you know, oh, let's see. Well, I would say, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Uh, this is Dr. Lowe. I would say advice. You know, uh, this chapter is, is, is really important, planning and evaluation, as well as collaboration and partnerships. And, and I would think don't get too bogged down with step four of this model, step five of this model. That's why I really like the general model of planning. Um, and I think the general principles we tried to get through today is what I really want to leave you with. The importance, of, the importance of needs assessment, the importance of knowing what you're doing before you get there, and, and, and the ability to say no to a program that looks so easy because CDC developed it, the state of whatever developed it, your public health agency, your organization, but it just doesn't fit. And so that may need you to do adaptation or even create a new program. So, so knowing that and, and having good objectives, having people work right with you and a good evaluation um, is really the key. I mean, it's really the trick to, to making these programs work. 
So again, um, while there may be a question on pre-seed, proceed uh, on the exam about the phases, I mean, that would be important to go over. Uh, the general principles of planning is what's important. And for uh, yeah, Marshall, because yeah. if you if you uh, look at every single planning model or collaboration model, evaluation model, you're going to see cons repeated, consistent themes and concepts. So, um, so the more you review those, you'll see those will be familiar to you, and they will be with you for the rest of your career. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just you yeah, remember. you don't need to worry about what step this and step that. You really need to think about stakeholder engagement, tailor the population, understanding the population, being able to diagnose the problem using you know various uh, types of data um, and information to make your decisions and theory to make your decisions. So those are the things that are just consistent threads throughout all of this. Um, so stick with that and you'll do fine. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you so much for the very comprehensive presentation today. Uh, yeah. And again, this will be posted on the NBPHE website on the uh, link that's on the screen. And we hope that you will join us uh, for the next couple of webinars that are um, approaching the next couple of weeks. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Liller. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. We really appreciate your time and your effort and uh, your dedication to public health. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.